Cuba's geography and location have done much to shape not just the island's history, but how it has developed over time, its revolutions, and its culture. To see why, join me for this brief look at the political geography of Cuba. Cuba is the 104th largest country in the world, and the 14th largest in Latin America, quite small for the region's standards, although it is the largest in the Caribbean, over twice as big as the next one, the Dominican Republic. Given its status as an island, it is not surprising that the country has the 17th lowest average elevation in the world, at 108 meters or 354 feet, surpassing the Caribbean only by Trinidad and Tobago. Although it does have three small mountain ranges known as the Cordillera Guaniguanico, Escambray Mountains, and the Sierra Maestra at the western, central, and southeastern points of the island respectively. The latter boasts the country's highest peak, Pico Turquino, which rises to a respectable 1,974 meters or 6,476 feet high. It is also not surprising that Cuba is hot, with an average temperature of 28 degrees Celsius in the summer and 23 degrees Celsius in the winter, and its climate varies little as the vast majority of the island has tropical savanna conditions, meaning that in effect, Cuba only has two seasons, the dry one, roughly from November to April, and the rainy one, from May to October. Small distinctive pockets do exist though, largely as a result of the Sierra Maestra, so that for example, the area around Guantanamo Bay is actually semi-arid because of the rain shadow of the neighboring mountains. These conditions also mean that fauna or flora endemic or common to the island, like the national bird, the tocororo, or the national fruit, the mamey, are not confined to any particular spot in the country, but live and grow throughout. Cuba is the 10th Latin American country with the most people, with over 11 million inhabitants, just below Guatemala's 16 million. Relatively speaking, this is a densely populated country with 102 people per square mile, although this is quite low for Caribbean standards, where all the other major countries surpass it. Haiti, for example, has quadrupled the density at 423 people per square mile. Nearly 20% of those people live in Havana, which is by far the largest and most important city in the country. The rest of the island's population is much more evenly distributed, with major cities from east to west in Guantanamo, Santiago, Bayamo, Holguín, Las Tunas, Camagüey, Cienfuegos, Santa Clara, Matanzas, and Pinar del Río, ranging from 400,000 to just over 100,000 respectively. Given the rough geographical uniformity in the country, Cuba zones have been developed not so much as a result of natural forces, but cultural ones. Thus, the island is traditionally divided into three regions. These are Oriente, or the Eastern Zone, Centro, or the Central Zone, and the Occidente, or Western Zone. Oriente is the smallest of the three, but has played a disproportionate role in Cuban and even world history. It was here, for example, that the Spanish first began settling the island, establishing the first European village at Baracoa in 1512 and later Bayamo in 1513. It was also here that some of the most important Spanish expeditions ever departed from. Hernán Cortés on his way to conquer Mexico in 1518 and Hernando de Soto on his way to Florida in 1538. Of course, its strategic importance made it a juicy target for pirates and other European powers, so its main city, Santiago, was plundered several times including in 1553 by the French and 1603 by the English. This prompted the Spanish to build a fortress around the bay, the Castillo de San Pedro de la Roca, a UNESCO heritage site you can still visit today. More importantly for Cubans, the region has always been one of revolutionaries, which has significantly shaped the path of the island. The area, for instance, was the birthplace of Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, the man behind the cry of Yara, the initial insurrection in 1868 that began the Ten Years' War a failed attempt at Cuban independence. Antonio Maceo, a participant in that conflict, in a later war in 1896 against the Spanish. Tomás Estrada Palma, yet another participant of the Ten Years' War who was later exiled in the U.S. and led the resistance to the Spanish from abroad and became the first president of an independent Cuba. Vilma Espín, one of the early revolutionaries against Batista, and Reynaldo Arenas, a gay poet and novelist who originally supported the revolution but later became a dissident once the government started persecuting people in the 60s and 70s. Most famously though, it was here that Fidel Castro was born in 1926 at a sugar plantation in Biran, about one hour and 45 minutes north of Santiago. Thus, not surprisingly, many key moments in the history of Cuba occurred in Oriente, including the creation of the national anthem, La Valla Mesa, 
first played after a victory for the Cuban rebels near Bayamo in 1868, as well as multiple other crucial battles during the Cuban War of Independence and the Spanish-American War, such as the Battle of Los Rios in May 1895, where José Martí was killed, or the Battle of San Juan Hill, just outside of Santiago in July 1898. Likewise, it was here that Fidel Castro first challenged the Batista government with his attack on the Moncada Barracks, a military garrison in Santiago, in July 1953, which ultimately failed. But most importantly for modern Cuba, it was Oriente where Fidel and his men first began the Cuban Revolution when they landed near Cabo Cruz in 1956. Today, the site is part of a national park and features the most pristine and impressive coastal cliffs bordering the western Atlantic. As it happens, this is hardly the only impressive national park in the area. Just north, there is the Alejandro de Humboldt National Park, an area whose protection began to be laid out in the 1960s and is named after the German naturalist credited as the father of ecology who visited the island in 1800 and 1801. The park is extremely high in biological diversity and full of endemic species including the almiki, a shrew-like animal, the catei, a kind of parrot, and plants like the nisperillo and a type of palm, the dracaena cubensis. Culturally, the region is also unique compared to the rest of the island. That is because various waves of immigrants from the wider Antilles, as well as access to the influence of the Eastern Caribbean through its various ports, combined with the pre-existing mestizo society and especially Afro-Cuban culture to form its own distinct mix. This has led to the creation of classic genres including trova and bolero, romantic types of music with roots in the late 19th century, which were embraced by the rest of Latin America in the 20th. Another example is the son cubano, a type of music with a more obvious blend of Spanish and African traditions, best known for its emblematic clave rhythm, a characteristic that would later be the basis for the development of salsa in the 20th century. Because of that, Oriente is known for its pioneer musicians like Sindo Garay, one of the most prolific of the trova composers, and two you might be more familiar with because of their participation in the Buena Vista Social Club, Compay Segundo and Ibrahim Ferrer. Today, probably the best place to see all of this in a single place is at Santiago's Carnival, the biggest festival in Cuba and one of the oldest in Latin America. Next is El Centro, or Central Zone. The region had three of the seven original villages the Spanish founded in the island, Camagüey, Trinidad, and Santi Espíritus, all established in 1514. And although the region sometimes gets overlooked by Cuban history buffs compared to the other two, El Centro contributed a number of key historical figures. The first is Ignacio Agramonte, perhaps the most radical figure of the Ten Years' War against the Spanish, who became known for his military feats. Another is Domitilia García Coronado, considered to be the first female journalist in the country who did much to spread the Cuban patriots' messages and was a pioneer in advocating for women's rights. Finally, there's Gerardo Machado, a dominant figure in the Cuban politics of the early 20th century who was also the first person in the island to be removed by a coup. There are also several crucial historical events that happened here. Beyond the number of battles in the war against the Spanish, it was here at Guaymaro that in 1869 the first Cuban constitution was written, the first document to abolish slavery in the island, and officially adopted the country's first flag. There were also two key developments that shaped modern Cuba. The first was the decisive military engagement of the Cuban Revolution, the Battle of Santa Clara, where Che famously derailed a train full of troops and supplies sent by Batista, and later, in combination with Camilo Cienfuegos, took the city, prompting Batista to leave the island about 12 hours later. Decades afterwards, Che would be entombed in a giant mausoleum in the city as a celebration of this triumph. The second event of note was the so-called Uber Matos Affair, a situation where the provincial government of Camagüey, one of the original Cuban revolutionaries, criticized the communist turn the revolution was taking, which prompted Fidel to crack down and have Uber Matos arrested at Camagüey on October 21, 1959 by Camilo Cienfuegos. Matos was then immediately sent to prison in Havana. Eight days later, when Cienfuegos himself also tried to fly back to the capital, his plane disappeared, leaving behind one of the greatest mysteries in Cuban history. And thus, in one fell swoop, Fidel Castro was able to neutralize his main opposition, leading to his uncontested personal command of the island for the rest of his life. Meanwhile, the area is best known for its tourist attractions. There's Cienfuegos, a town not named after Camilo, but rather a former governor of Cuba, José Cienfuegos, which is known for the neoclassical architecture of its downtown itself the result of the French immigrants who settled the place in the 1820s and the riches that came from its advantageous trading position in the latter part of the 19th century. Then there's Santi Espíritus, a pleasant colonial town 
featuring the Yayabo Bridge and the Colonial Art Museum. Housed in the mansion of a rich family that fled Cuba after Fidel's revolution, the Villa Isnaga clan. Further west, nestled between it and Cienfuegos, lies Cuba's best preserved colonial town of all, Trinidad, the result of fortunes made from sugar in the nearby Valle de los Ingenios, the center of sugar production in Cuba from the 18th to the 19th century. Finally, for those more interested in nature, there's the largest coral reef in the Americas, second only to Australia's Great Barrier Reef in the nearby Playa de Santa Lucia. Meanwhile, the region has also contributed to the country's cultural scene. People like Nicolás Guillén, Cuba's national poet, famous for the Afro-Cuban themes in his work, as well as Antonio Machín, the first Cuban person to sell a million records for his version of El Manicero, or Peanut Vendor. But perhaps the best-known person was Benny Moré, El Bárbaro del Ritmo, a band leader and songwriter notorious for his mastery of the various Cuban musical genres during his lifetime, and his most famous song, The Mambo Bonito y Sabroso, released in 1951. Finally, there's Occidente, the western part of the island. The region has been the center of power in Cuba ever since the capital was moved from Santiago to Havana in 1607 as a result of Spanish conquests in Mexico and Peru and the more favorable ocean winds which made the port one of the central stopping points of the gold galleons on their way back to Europe. This long hegemony as the island's most important city has left a very clear imprint on its landscape from the various Spanish fortresses guarding its bay like La Cabaña, La Fuerza, El Morro, and El Castillo, the last three of which are in Havana's coat of arms, to the iconic parts of the city which usually represent Cuba to the world, like Old Havana, El Capitolio, the Plaza of the Revolution, and of course the Malecón. The city even has a place from a non-Cuban, which nonetheless holds global fascination, Ernest Hemingway's house in the city, Finca La Vigia. Given this pattern, it is not surprising that the most well-known Cubans around the world also hail from here including people like Jose Martí, Andy Garcia, and Jose Canseco, as well as the three most famous women by far, Omara Portuondo, Celia Cruz, and Gloria Estefan, all musicians. Nor is the notoriety limited to people. This region also has the most famous resort in the country, Paradero, a beach that has been attracting tourists since at least the 1870s and has had all sorts of celebrities visit, including Al Capone, and three other things that Cuba is known for, Cuban cigars, the tobacco for which comes from Pinar del Rio, but are usually manufactured in Havana, and the country's national cocktails, the mojito and the rum and coke, both created in Havana at the beginning of the 20th century, although the exact story of how this happened is contested. Another important aspect of Occidente is that it has been one of the epicenters of Afro-Cuban culture in the island. It was here, for instance, that the two largest slave rebellions in Cuba occurred one led by José Antonio Aponte near Havana in 1825 and one by La Negra Carlota in 1843. Both failed, but Afro-Cuban culture would thrive. This is especially true in Matanzas, which produced La Sonora Matancera, the single most influential Cuban band in history as they were pioneers in spreading Cuban music to the world, and Pérez Prado, the most prolific composer of mambos, including probably every single one you have ever heard, like Mambo No. 5. That Pérez Prado was able to do this at all was because he came from this rich musical area in Occidente, which had already produced cha-cha-cha, rumba, and danzón, all stemming from the strong Afro-Cuban tradition. Much later, in the late 1980s, a new generation would produce yet another genre, timba, a variation of salsa usually attributed to NG La Banda. Cuba is divided into 15 provinces, which are further split into 168 municipalities, this is a relatively new development as throughout most of its history the island was divided into a mere six, Pinar del Rio, La Habana, Matanzas, Santa Clara, Camagüey, and Oriente. Given Cuba's political structure, a single party system that has zero federal elements, they have little significance beyond their administrative status, but if the regime ever opens up, they might very well in the future. Thus we conclude our trip across the Cuban landscape, a fascinating country that I hope you can all visit someday.